Here's a, here's a magnified pollen grain on, on this side where my hand is. Uh, anyway, um, bees, uh, why do they collect pollen? Pollen is their protein. So, uh, and they get fat from it and minerals. So, uh, w when a bee, a forager bee goes out into the, um, leaves the hive, uh, it collects uh, four different things. Nectar, so a bee does not collect honey when it goes to a flower. There's no honey on the flower, but there's nectar. And uh, that's the carbohydrate that we use and the bees need uh, as an organism. The second thing, not in an order, collects is po uh, pollen, which is protein, and uh, collects water uh, to dilute the nectar, also to uh, air condition the hive if the temperature exceeds 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and it collects a resinous substance from trees called um, propolis, which it uses to sort of glue things together and, and cover up crevices. So then, uh, related to all this is, obviously, when a flowering plant, a plant in flower is sprayed with an insecticide, a fungus, a fungicide, uh, the bee is carrying this back to the hive. And unfortunately now, I think th this is almost unbelievable, they've identified within the wax, which acts like the liver in the hive and absorbs all this stuff, like 157 pesticides and fungicides in the wax in a hive. Fortunately, it doesn't go get incorporated into the honey. So as she, uh, uh, Mother Ozan said earlier, when you want pristine lawns and so on and so forth, uh, there's a price being paid for it. I remember early on, my wife was having an engagement party at our house and she was embarrassed that there were dandelions in bloom on the lawn. And uh, she started going out with a knife to cut them off and I said, leave them alone. And as you know from television in the spring, the major uh, uh, herbicide companies have great ads like it's an embarrassment to you and your family and your neighbors if there are these yellow flowering things on your lawn when after they finish flowering you don't even know they're there and since they put out these little parachutes that you could blow on and the seeds are back there anyway next year why bother <laughs> so anyway uh, you know do we have to do something to produce food? We certainly do. Uh, apples are sprayed very heavily. Uh, there's so many things that affect uh, the, the apple as it's growing. But we need to have more of a balance uh, in order to protect the honeybee, which, by the way, pollinates one-third of the crops we eat. So one-third of what you eat will be gone if the pollinators disappear. Not so much the vegetables, although for continuity, they need pollination to have mm -hmm. the next generation, but all those fruits and things, and the, um, the clover that dairy animals are dependent on. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Could you say a little uh, bit uh, about the synthetic pesticide, that their category called neonics? The um, neonicotinoids. Yes, right. And it's called neonicotinoid because it's um, nicotine it used to be, any, I mean, some people's mothers, grandparents might have like um, put their cigarette butts in water and then you spray them on your roses, kills everything. Because <laughs> nicotine is, is a potent insecticide. And um, I'm not sure chemically, but the, there's, a rela there's a synthetic relationship between the neonicotinoids and nicotine. Mm -hmm. And they kill everything. <laughs> um, and um, it used to be the neonicotinoids, the, the class of pesticides, and as an arborist, I'm a certified uh, pesticide applicator. I have to learn all that stuff to, um, of how it applies in the landscape. And, um, and the neonics historically had just been used on non-food crops, like cotton. Cotton is one of the biggest sponges for pesticides in the country because every insect loves to eat it and it's vulnerable to fungi. Um, 
and it would be used a lot like if you if your birch tree is, is unhealthy and you call somebody and they treat it with um, imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid, to protect it from bronze birch borer. Um, it's used, it used to be used mostly in the ornamental landscape and in non-food crops. But it's in, um, certain forms of it are now being used on food crops. And there was a um, recent um, catastrophic bee loss in, um, localized catastrophic bee loss in Ontario related to um, seed that was treated with a neonicotinoid pesticide when it was planted, the dust from the, from the seed drifted over to beehives and bees foraging picked up this pesticide and they could prove beyond, you know, conclusively that it was that seed treatment that was linked to these, the death of these extremely healthy bees. So, um, the ban, they're, banned in, they're banned in Europe now. Um, it's right, a two-year exactly. ban. As, as of May, they, uh, there was a, a ban. Exactly the the yeah. A two-year experimental ban in Europe. Mm -hmm. Those affected most are the littlest humans. And um, they're affected because they're down on the ground. So think about your lawn and treating your lawn in order not to have dandelions and how beautiful that is to crawl in. Or your new carpeting that's been treated with chemicals um, and that is also tactilely young to toddlers, etc. And then they put their hands in their mouth. Um, with the baby bottles are treated with BHT. As soon as those baby bottles start to get scratched up, they're um, toxic. They're, they're leaching the toxins. Um, so there's, there is legislation, you know, many people are looking at creating legislation. Just recently, the GMO legislation in Connecticut was, uh, came up again. I heard last year there were 20 people at the Capitol protesting uh, not having labeling for GMO uh, related food and this year there were 400 so I don't know what that means for next year I don't I couldn't follow the bill because I was still in the 10 weeks that I allowed for myself to <laughs> finish the project and so although I did call um, both of my state representatives um, and ask them where they stood on that bill uh, and one of them I talked to staff people um, and one of them actually returned my call didn't have the time to return it. Um, but, you know, that's the, the thing to do um, at this point in time is to let, you know, I used to think, oh my gosh, I, well, I'm not really secure enough in my understanding of this to talk to my legislator. I didn't really have to be that secure in my understanding to call a legislator and say, where do you stand? Um, you know, I think this is important. I'm interested in it. I want to know what, you know, where do you stand on it? Well, there were two bills with the GMO one was just flat out mark label the GMOs. The other was label baby food that has uh, that that has GMOs in it. And so, um, why we needed a special one for baby food, I'm not quite sure. I thought that was very interesting. Um, but that there was a special one for baby food must there must have been a need for it somewhere. So those are the kinds of things that we can. The, my, my conclusion, which of course, I, hopefully I have a long life left ahead for me and I'll come to many other um, deeper conclusions, but my conclusion um, that was influenced by the fellow who wrote Green Intelligence, he, this is a Yale, I don't know if he's a Yale guy, but he's, I think he is, he's a professor at Yale. Yeah, professor of environmental policy, risk analysis, and blah, blah, blah at Yale. <laughs> um, and, um, what he says is it's about transparency. We need to make them tell us what's in it. And then we know that the, the reason that Sister Ozan talked about um, the situation in what part of Canada was it? Ontario. Ontario um, is that you think the farmers don't know that these pesticides and these GMO products and, and the issues are on the ground where the bees are? All the farmers know it, but the companies that produce this stuff put enough doubt in the mind of the consumer and have so much 
power over what's done in agriculture that it, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So this, this idea that we need to have transparency, we need to be able to force them to tell us what's in it, and not only that the amount the amount um, prescribed to apply to your lawn will not hurt your children or your animals um, when, uh, according to the literature, there's only about 20% of us who can understand the instructions. Sister Ozone has mentioned that she is an arborist who has had a, a deep instruction in how to apply pesticides in order to be able to do it properly. How many of us have had that? And yet we all go to Lowe's and we buy it and we spray it um, and so do our neighbors, um, and so do people who um, haven't got enough education to be able to read the, the, the labels, are, don't have the literacy, are here um, without the English language skills, and that, and there it is, in English. Um, so, uh, again, 20% of us for the, do you know the number <coughs> of the chemicals that we're talking about? We're talking about can't do it. It's just a phenomenal number of chemicals that are in, that we're breathing all the time, that we're taking in, that we're touching, that we're putting ourselves at risk. And again, it's the little bees, it's the little kids. And those young people are developing conditions while their brains are developing. And the, 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 the um, path that they will take is being affected by these chemicals and the path that their brain is going to leave open to them for the rest of their lives. I'm 60 years old. That's, a, that's not even enough. And to imagine that the brain is damaged for somebody's profit for the rest of your life for throwaway kids. That's what we're talking about. So, so let me just say this because I, I really have to finish on this because this is depressing. I mean, it wore me out. Um, in, in working on it because if you, when you look at the exhibit you'll see that there's so much detail in this work and it was a reference, the detail is a reference to the pollen and so I needed it and I wanted it and I like the detail, it helps me to meditate and all of a sudden I was realizing that you know I'm being completely drained by dwelling on this so I had to come, I had to, to create a hopeful piece and I'm come from in a long line of Buddhist books that tell me, you know, hope is in the future, stay in the present. But I just had, couldn't, I had to reject rejecting hope. <laughs> so one of the pieces in the exhibit is a piece that asks part for participation from the viewer. Um, and I don't identify the person who's visiting as a viewer. I identify as the person who's visiting, all of us, um, as a participant. And I'm asking that you actually touch the exhibit. It's, it's paper, um, it's handmade paper, and the handmade paper is seeded with wildflower seeds that are intended to be attractive to bees. So if you tear off a piece of the paper, and put it in the envelope that's provided, and take it home, and then follow the instructions on the envelope. And then there's a you know, couple of steps. You kind of have to cultivate a little ground and watch it. But then maybe take a picture of what's grown, or draw a picture of what you see, or add some more seeds to the area. Um, write a poem about it, write a story about it, tell about who you introduced to this garden, and, and, and th that you talked you took that step further and talked further about what's happening with the bees and, and your commitment to whatever you're committed to. Um, and then get that stuff back to me. And then the next time this exhibit is shown, it can be shown with a process book that shows that the reinvestment in the project that is a reinvestment in the slow-moving process of organic development. And that's what, how the, that piece of the project is entitled. It's called, and uh, Al, I'm going to ask you to, to make sure that, um, or to, to let me know one or more ways that this is pronounced. But I've pronounced it ontogeny. Is that correct? Or is it ontogeny? Ontogeny. Ontogeny. Um, 
So that's my invitation and also my hope um, and the hopefulness that I was forced by um, my humanity to uh, invest in the, in the, uh, in the work.